Really? You you think he could you think he could someday win? Yeah? I don't know. I mean, you know, he's Catholic. Okay. December 7th, 1940. Adolf Hitler has told his command for months that he wants to attack the USSR in 1941, and rough plans have been made for such an invasion. This week, though, the German high command starts getting serious. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, the Japanese tried and failed to push back the Chinese nationalists with their Han River operation. There was skirmishing in the Mediterranean, civil unrest in Romania, and the Greek counteroffensive continued to push back the Italians. Here's what follows. On the 5th, Adolf Hitler speaks about his plan for attacking the USSR and stresses that it's more important to capture Leningrad and Stalingrad than Moscow, since the former are Bolshevik breeding grounds. Some of his generals strongly disagree, but everybody agrees that the USSR will be easily defeated. The Red Army is leaderless, General Franz Halder told the gathering. The Russian soldier was mindless. The Red Army was as inferior in weapons as the French Army had been. The lack of modern Russian field batteries gave the German Panzer a free hand. The Russians had nothing but badly armored units to oppose the German armor. The German army would split the Russian forces into separate pieces, thereby strangling them by encirclement. The gathering is a meeting of Hitler and his high command at the Chancellery to discuss the plans that OKH, Army Command, and OKW, Armed Forces Command, have been separately preparing since August and June, respectively. Both plans agree that surrounding the Red Army near the Soviet borders is the recipe for success. The danger of engulfment by the vast spaces of the Russian interior had dominated German general staff thinking since the previous century, when Napoleon's failure to defeat the Russians in their borderlands had first drawn him to Moscow and then condemned him to drag the Grand Army back again through the winter snows. Hitler, too, recalled the retreat from Moscow, which had destroyed the Grand Army, but he believed the Red Army could itself be destroyed by deep armored thrusts through and behind its frontier positions, creating cauldrons in which its fighting units would be rendered down to inert pulp. The OKH plan is pretty much a blueprint for this, with with panzer spearheads and circling Red Army pockets. Halder advocates this plan with great emphasis on taking Moscow at an early stage of the battle for several reasons. Under Stalin, all authority is concentrated there. The transport system, the railways, are centered there. And German intel estimates put much of the country's war industry there. Now that last is actually faulty intelligence, but the first two points are valid. So Hunger is disturbed that Hitler is more and more drawn to the OKW plan that delays a drive on Moscow until the Baltic and Ukrainian cauldrons have been dealt with. The 1812 factor is important though, and the German generals are well aware of it. Fedor von Bock even tells Hitler on the third that the USSR was an enormous country whose military strength was unknown, and such a war might be difficult even for the Wehrmacht. And there are going to be serious transport issues and, and technical problems getting to the White Sea, the Caspian Sea, and the Volga River, Hitler's Archangel Astrakhan line where he figures an advance too would trigger Russia's collapse. But all of the high command do agree that war with the USSR is inevitable and most welcome a battle against what they see as Germany's Bolshevik and Slav enemies. Well, now the work starts being done to transform the plan into a further directive. But one possible invasion that may take place sooner is that of Gibraltar. We've talked a bunch about German thoughts and plans for Gibraltar before. Either the idea of having Spain join the Axis powers in the war, or allowing German troops to go through Spain to attack Gibraltar. Well, this week, Hitler is making one last try. On the 7th, Abwehr chief Wilhelm Canaris meets Francisco Franco in Madrid, ideally to get him to agree that German forces should begin moving through Spain within a month. Franco refuses. As I've said before, Canaris has actually been 
actively trying to keep Franco and Spain from Germany and is working for Germany's defeat in the war. And he's already come under a lot of suspicion for his actions. General Munoz Grandes accused Canaris outright of persuading Franco to stay out of the war. Other sources alerted Gestapo senior officer Walter Huppenkoten to Canaris' actions. The Gestapo certainly passed these reports on to Heinrich Himmler, but Canaris, not for the first time, survived mere suspicions. And not for the last time, Himmler, faced with evidence implicating Canaris in high treason, refrained from further investigations. Thing is, Franco knows his people are in no way ready for a new war just after the ravages of the civil war that ended last year. And to him, an attack on Gibraltar would require Spanish forces to carry out the operation as a matter of honor. Germany, though, is unwilling to provide Spain the weapons and supplies to make such an offensive. There is also the rather big point that the British are paying Franco's generals millions of dollars in secret bribes to keep Spain neutral. And without Germany defeating Britain first, Britain can easily set up a naval blockade of Spain, cutting off the supplies from the USA that are essential for Spanish survival. I like the way Max Hastings phrases it. British sea power exercised an important, though invisible, influence upon events. It might also have a visible one. On the 3rd, Britain announces that it has placed an order with US shipyards for 60 merchant ships. But Britain is not just making plans for the seas. On the night of the 7th, a patrol by a British armored car unit verifies details of a gap in a specific Italian minefield in North Africa. And so, the first major British land advance of the war begins in secrecy. Wait, what? You may be asking. The answer lies in the future. There are land advances this week, though, that I must address. The Greek counteroffensive against the Italian invaders continues. On the 4th, Greek forces enter Primeti. On the 5th, the Greek 2nd Corps breaks into Albania. And the 6th, the Greek advance up the coast continues, taking Saranda, a major Albanian port. Further east, the Greeks capture the Suhe Pass and the heights around Kakavia Pass. But the weather is not good for fighting. The counteroffensive might be running out of steam. One thing about this Italo-Greek war is that it is really diverting Italian resources from Africa, where they have already been needed and will be even more necessary in case of any British offensive. The Italians are sending many times as many men to Albania as they are to North Africa, and by now have assigned 10% of their merchant fleet to supply Albania, tying up 94 ships. The last three months of this year, 15,711 men are sent from Italy to Africa by ship. 153,850 go by ship to Albania or Greece during that same time period. But Italy is, of course, at war in both regions. Though you can really see how priorities change, back on November 1st, Italian Army Chief of Staff Pietro Badoglio, a top Italian leader even back in World War I, had said at a general staff meeting that Rodolfo Graziani's Italian September offensive in North Africa which had stalled and had been accumulating supplies since for another attack, meant little, and the important problem now was Greece. But up until then, he had been worried by the British buildup in Africa, and Naval Chief of Staff Domenico Cavagnari had urged him to focus there because victory there would make everything fall into place. Well, times change, and Graziani's pleas for more men and material in Africa went unheeded. And things still have gone bad so far in Greece. Thus, this week, Badoglio is out as chief of staff and is replaced by Ugo Cavaliero. There was great dissatisfaction, which Mussolini could not divert from himself by firing Marshal Pietro Badoglio, the chief of the general staff, instead of his son-in-law, Count Ciano, whom many Italians blamed for pushing Italy into the Greek adventure. Cavagnari, by the way, is also replaced as Navy Chief of Staff in a few days by Arturo Riccardi. There is more news this week from the Italian peninsula, actually, though not from Italy itself. On December 2nd, the Vatican speaks out against Germany's T4 program, Germany's 
euthanasia program for people deemed too mentally or psychologically sick to be allowed to live, calling it contrary to natural and positive divine law, and that the direct killing of an innocent person because of mental or physical defects is not allowed. But this year, 1940, nearly 10,000 people each are killed at the centers Grafenek, Hartheim, and Brandenburg. That's of a yearly overall total of around 35,000 people. The Brandenburg and Grafenek operations wind down, as the year does, partly because they've done a fairly thorough job, and partly because of public opposition. There are many medical personnel and clergy in Germany who protest at the practice of euthanasia as being barbaric. Some such protests have even reached the ears of Adolf Hitler. But the program does not end, though this week does, with Greek advances into Albania and German plans for future ones into the Soviet Union. Something I haven't had a chance to talk about the past few weeks. American ambassador to the United Kingdom, Joseph Kennedy, who has several children that seem very interested in politics, resigned after he gave a newspaper interview to the Boston Sunday Globe saying that democracy is finished in England November 10th. He added, and it may be here. Kennedy's position, re the war, stands in direct contrast to that of American President Franklin Roosevelt or British Prime Minister Winston Churchill. Even after the Battle of Britain had begun, Kennedy hoped for a personal meeting between himself and Adolf Hitler to sort things out between Germany and the States. And he rejected Churchill's belief that compromise with Germany was impossible. He argued, strongly, against sending economic and military aid to Britain, since he very much believed that Britain would fall, and the only reason to send anything would be to buy time for the States. It seems, though, that not only shall Britain not fall anytime soon, but the States have plenty of time without buying any more because Germany has its focus on the USSR. It's interesting to think that with Britain still active, Germany could one day have a two or even three front war. But I suppose that could only happen if the German plans for the Soviets don't play out. I guess we'll just have to wait and see. If you'd like to learn more about the background of the Nazis' systemic purge of those who they deem undesirable, you can check out our War Against Humanity episode about the concentration camp system right here in just a minute. Our patron of the week is Eric Brewster. Thanks to people like Eric, we are able to continue making and continue improving this show. So do the right thing. Join the Time Ghost Army at patreon.com or timeghost.tv and share our videos. You might not think that helps, but it really does help a lot. Click the bell. See you next time.